Welcome to the presentation on mapping numbers to sound. Um, I would like to thank Anastia Chernysheva for sitting right over there for <laughs> inviting us to participate in David Rosenblum's residency on art science collaborations. Um, so in the first half, Martin Grubla and I will discuss um, using data sonification for scientific discovery. And then we'll hand it over to David, who's going to talk about using EEG signals to create uh, immersive musical experiences. And we'll end with discussion and questions. So all of the events surrounding David Rosenblum's uh, residency have centered on this idea of artists and scientists collaborating. So this first half is going to be a story of one such collaboration, um, which like so many collaborations came about almost by accident. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, Stephen Taylor and I had been organizing a symposium called The Sound of Science. And um, in the meantime, I guess that Martin had been s arranging to do uh, a sabbatical with his colleagues in, at a lab in Germany. Um, but as you know, in the fall of 2020, uh, it wasn't really feasible to do international <laughs> conferences and sabbaticals. But Stephen Taylor <coughs> introduced all of us to each other, and we started meeting via Zoom. Um, to discuss ways that data visualization and data sonification could be used together as a tool for scientific discovery. And we've been meeting every Thursday ever since. So when people hear the word data, many times the first thing that comes to mind is a picture, something like a graph or uh, maybe a color-coded map. But there's no reason that you can't um, map data to some other sensory modality. Like you could imagine mapping data to a haptic glove and then feeling the pattern of the data on your hand. Mm -hmm. But in our case, we were interested in exploring the ways that sound could convey information, which immediately raises a question. Is it even possible for sound, by which I mean non-speech sound, to convey information. So let's do an experiment, and which I'll, I'm gonna hand it over to the scientists to run the experiment. And All right, let's, let's <laughs> run the experiment. You'll be the guinea pigs. <laughs> but it's a, you know, don't worry. <laughs> uh, so Carl actually found a coin on the way over here. So that's, I think it's 25 instead of just a penny, so it's 25 fold lock. And actually our example is about uh, coin uh, tossing. So, you know, if I flip this coin and, and check out what I get, there's, if it's a fair coin, there's a 50-50 chance it might come up uh, heads or tails. But you would actually have trouble if I just did this in the front here. You know, it would be difficult for you to visualize from back there, at least at the very end of the room, what's actually going on. It looks kind of similar, you know, either way. But with sound, uh, we can actually easily convey this information. So, for instance, if this came out heads, which is what I've got up here, so this is a, a not fair coin, it's just doing heads, 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 over again. Now, on the other hand, if I go to the tail side or eagle, we have a low pitch sound. So this is also an unfair coin, it's going, you know, uh, tails, tails, tails. So let's listen to a fair coin. And you, you heard, it's actually you know, <clears throat> it's playing the, the high and the low pitch, so the, the heads and the tails about half the time. Nonetheless, there were some stretches in there where it was just going bop, 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 bop for a while. Right? It can happen by sheer coincidence. You get five or six times, you might get the same in a row. But on, on average, overall, it's going to be 50-50. Uh, uh, um, so what we're going to do now is uh, Carla's going to play an unfair coin. Uh, and we want you to tell us you know, where it's actually unfair towards the heads side, which is the higher pitch, or the tail side, which is the lower pitch. That should be enough. What do you say? Head. Head. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I'm actually curious, so I'm going to take a poll now. That's my, the actual little science experiment. 
Um, when you were trying to do this, were you just listening to the gestalt of the sound? Or did you actually go like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, you know, and count the sides? Is there anybody who listened to the gestalt? Raise your hand. Okay, that's what most people did. Anybody who actually tends to count when it's slow like this? So I confess I'm actually one of those people who just goes <laughs> one, two, three, four, one, <laughs> five, six, seven, two, <laughs> as the thing counts on both sides. But on the other hand, Carla can thwart me in that. So we'll play one more uh, unfair coin that's biased in a different way from the one that you just listened to. And, and she's going to play it, I think, faster, right? Start. Oh, okay. yeah, there we go. So let's listen to that one. That should be enough. What do you say, more high or more low? Hi. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh -huh. I think the musicians have it. That's probably <laughs> over on that side. So it, it, it was <clears throat> biased that way. But, but one thing is for sure, though, that I was not counting. I wasn't going to. <clears throat> there was just no way to do it. The best thing I can do at this point is kind of do a humor, brrr, or more brrr, and, and that's about it. Okay? But now, this is a very simple example. But clearly, I can convey information by doing this that you really would not have been able to get really from me without a magnifying glass or a telescope, you know, tossing the coin back and forth and actually seeing, you know, how it comes out. So, all right. Let's go to the next slide, Carla. <laughs> so, so it seems like sound can convey information, um, but how? Uh, what are the different ways that sound can convey meaning? So here's a short example that tells a story through sound. So in the, that sad story, the sound of the bird is an icon because it's a literal imitation of the sound that you'd hear in the environment. So the splash of the gun would also be Or icons. in this case, the picture of a bird. And a picture. Um, the playing of taps, on the other hand, um, kind of requires that we share a common culture. Because in our culture, we've learned to associate taps with the end of the day or a funeral or something sad. Um, but the interesting one is the descending slide whistle sound, because that's an index that is um, linking the altitude, mapping the altitude of the bird to the pitch of that slide whistle so that they change together. Like in the good old Wally Coyote cartoons. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, um, and, and for the most part, I think we mostly use indexes when we're doing data sonification. Here's a familiar example of an index, um, the graph of an audio waveform. Um, so the waveform graph is an index that links changes in air pressure measured at one point to the height in a 2D graph, where the horizontal direction is time. Um, and when you edit in a wave editor, you're actually making quite a few assumptions because you're assuming that if you make the vertical direction in that graph shorter, you're going to have a correspondingly softer audio signal. Or if you stretch out the distance between those peaks, that you're going to have a lower frequency. Um, so the whole premise of data visualization is that it is possible to map from a source domain to a target domain in such a way that inferences you draw in the target domain hold true in the source domain as well. Um, so it's possible to map not just individual points, but the relation among the points um, from a source domain to a target domain. One of the particular strengths of a sonic index is in conveying the way structures change over time, otherwise known as dynamics. Because, in fact, sound and music can't even exist without time. If you just had a you know, constant air pressure, you would call it barometric pressure. But if that pressure is changing, especially if it's more than 20 times per second, you would interpret it as sound. 
um, and a single pitch is meaningless. Uh, you, in fact, your brain probably just relegates it to background, like when you hear um, the, the sound of a fan. However, if you make a sequence of changing intervals and pitches, you have the possibility to create music. All right, so <clears throat> one example you know, of things that scientists study is uh, protein folding. And uh, proteins are molecules that are made up of a uh, string of amino acids, like the string that you see twirling around there. And the string actually, in order to function, has to fold into a specific structure. So all these pieces eventually, at the end of this movie, will come together. Proteins do a lot of things uh, in our bodies. For instance, they may be enzymes that allow the cells to produce energy. They may be antibodies that allow your, bottle, uh, your body to battle uh, COVID-19 or something like that. Uh, but they can't do that unless they're actually properly folded. What you're seeing in this cartoon here is that this protein is searching randomly by squirming around for the folded state, which eventually will have three of those arrows that correspond to a three-fold beta strand form. And you can see actually the protein has just dropped into that uh, uh, structure. So what we're really interested in, in the experiments and the simulations that we do is understanding how we go from this, what, the, what is the journey that takes us from this random string that's over on one side here through a large number of structures eventually to this folded structure over there that can actually do its job as an antibody or an enzyme or something else in the cell. And you can see here there's a lot of different paths that can be taken. So there isn't just a single sequence that gets you straight down to where you might want to be. There's all kinds of alternatives that are open to this protein as it basically goes from the, folded to the, uh, from the unfolded to the folded state. Um, one way that we study this problem, besides doing experiments in the lab and you know, uh, mixing things up in a, in a biochem lab, is by computers, uh, just using simulation. Uh, you know, Newton discovered in the uh, you know, uh, <coughs> uh, 17th century already that we can use laws like F equals MA or something like that to actually calculate how atoms move around. And we can use computer simulations actually of how these atoms move around using those rules uh, to see if on a computer a protein can fold. Um, so what you're seeing on the uh, uh, right hand side here actually again recapitulates what uh, uh, Carla was talking about as far as you know, uh, symbols and icons are concerned. So if you look on the uh, left hand side of that structure, it shows you these little balls and sticks. And chemists basically imagine that the balls are atoms and the sticks are chemical bonds. But you know, atoms are only, you know, are sub-nanometer in size, really, really, really small, and there are no sticks really between them. Right? This is just a picture to be used to imagine. Uh, a biological chemist or a biologist prefer to kind of a picture like the one in the middle, where you actually take a whole bunch of these atoms, group them into amino acids, and then group those into what we call secondary structure, like those arrows or strands. That's basically that the sequence of amino acids of the protein winding its way around. And then finally, on the very right-hand side, you see a map of what the surface of the protein looks like. And that's actually probably the closest to something that you, can, you could really measure in an experiment. You could do a, an experiment with an atomic force microscope, which is basically a metal tip, stick it onto the protein, and then map out what the bumps and lumps on the surface look like to actually get that shape over there. So we're really much more on the side of an icon over there and much more on the side of a, a symbol over on the uh, left-hand side. So this is a visual example of that. Uh, but now let's talk a little bit about sound observables. So to compare the uh, simulation results to the experimental results, Taras computed the way that four observable measurements change over time. And he gave me a spreadsheet containing about three million rows in it um, with these measurements. Um, and that represents uh, less than a millisecond of simulated time in their physical model. So I wondered, what would it sound like if I took those three million numbers and just listened to them as if they were a digital audio recording? Um, so this is four uh, observables, um, and I just made a quad audio recording out of it. Mm -hmm. We can only hear two because we have a stereo playback here. But um, I'll just play what that sounds like. Um, what you can see is that um, 
I don't know if you can see my cursor, probably not. So the small where it's low is most of these observables have to do with the size mm -hmm. of the protein. So where it's small, that's where it's tending to be folded, and where it's big is where it is unfolded or disordered. So you can't tell that much <laughs> from, a, from that well, kind of a mapping. You can close your eyes and you can hear the burst every time it unfolds, but that's kind of it mm. for most of us probably listening to that particular sound. So I mean, it kind of makes you wish that mm -hmm. you could either maybe kind of zoom in or, see, or hear more detail. And if, so the first thing that I, you know, may come to mind is let's slow it down so that we can hear what's happening during those transitions. Um, and you can, you can slow it way, way down, but at some point you probably wouldn't hear it anymore because the changes would be happening at a sub-audio rate, like below the, rate of, below the range of human hearing. Um, however, if instead you slow the data rate way down, but then use that signal to control the parameter of a synthesis algorithm, then you could slow it down as much as you like and still monitor the changes, still be able mm -hmm. to hear the changes. Um, kind of like if I press a key on a synthesizer and use the tone, then we Exactly, the that is exactly that, modulation. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let me switch to Kima. Um, okay, so this is the same observable plotted with respect to time. Uh, but you won't hear it. You're only going to hear an oscillator, but this observable is going to control the frequency deviations and amplitude deviations on this oscillator. So it's what you heard earlier, the mosquito sound. So now you can either like speed up, go through the rows faster, or maybe more interesting, we can slow it way down. So you could hear details during the transition. OK, so the one thing we noticed right away when we did this was that we were hearing changes that were happening in between the frames of the visualization. So the next thing we wanted to try was to increase the time resolution. Um, and we also did a change of coordinate system. So here is the same observable again, but we're looking at a much shorter interval of time. Um, and there's a color coding of unfold, unfolded is dark purple and folded is dark purple, and transitions are yellow and green. This up above, you see a plot that is the exact same time interval. However, it's showing on the x-axis is showing the value of the observable, and the y-axis is showing the rate of change in that observable, like how much variation there is in that observable. Um, and then the red, the red dot is showing you the current time. And so if the protein compresses, we're over on the left-hand side, and if it expands, we're over on the right-hand side. Yeah. If the protein seems to not be jiggling a lot, we're at the bottom, and if it's wildly jiggling around, then we're at the top of that plot. So that's kind of what those two directions correspond to. And, and the other thing is that clustered over here on the left are the folded states, and clustered on the right are the unfolded states. So I'll play that. You can, if you want to give like the commentary over what's happening as we play this one. So the protein just folded, it just unfolded, and refolded again. It tried to unfold, but it couldn't quite make it. And same thing. And there we go. It's following a different kind of path here. Again, almost trying to unfold, but not quite making it. And you can actually see when you look at those yellow paths, there is a series of them at the top that seem to be relatively smooth going from one side to the other. And there's a series of them that lie sort of more in the bottom half of the yellow that seem to be more twirly and more uh, looped around. It's actually following one of those right now. And it's going to unfold again. Try to refold, can't make it. And 
almost folded but could not quite make it. And again try and couldn't make it. Right, I think that sort of gets the point across. So a protein folding process is not you're unfolded and boom, you fold and you're done. Right? It actually tries and almost makes it and then it doesn't. Or when it's folded, sometimes it might get hit by water molecules or thermal energy, it might cause it to unfold again. And maybe sometimes it manages to escape and just gets back there again. And sometimes it doesn't and it just falls over to the unfold side. And, and one might even think, well, that's bad. You know, isn't it better if the food protein is completely folded like a solid rock? But actually, you don't want that either. It actually turns out in order to function, like for instance, for oxygen to go into hemoglobin, which transports uh, you know, uh, oxygen through our blood, the hemoglobin molecule actually has to have those fluctuations in order to be able to absorb this molecule and take it to our muscle tissue. So those motions are important. And it's a price, so to speak, that you pay that, well, the protein can also unfold. <laughs> yeah, so when uh, we had noticed, as, as Martin's pointing out, that we noticed, well, there seems to be two kind of different styles of these transitions. Mm -hmm. There's the relatively sh quick ones that are very direct up at the top. <laughs> And then there's the wiggly, slower ones that like meander. Yeah, little um, daughters. The, and so we, call, we started calling the ones at the top the superhighway, and the ones at the bottom we called the alternate mm -hmm. path. But then we were asking our, ourselves, like, why? Why are some, what causes one to do meandering and one to just zip over? Um, and so um, Martin had this very strong hunch that it had something to do with the, the um, location and the timing of when different hydrogen bonds were forming that would cause these different mm -hmm. patterns. So, and a hydrogen bond, by the way, is, uh, you know, what, the protein is surrounded by water molecules. Water has oxygen and two hydrogen, it's the H2O, right? And the protein can actually either bind to the hydrogen or it can actually bind to the oxygen on, in that water molecule. And that will really make a difference of how that protein locally is able to move around. So we thought, Maybe that's the reason, and we could check that out using sound. So, so uh, Meredith, uh, <laughs> sorry. So Meredith generated another data set and a movie showing uh, when different hydrogen bonds were forming. Um, so we'll, I'll, I'll play the movie first. So, mm -hmm. and take a look at the movie. These red and white little. Dots, that, those are the water molecules, okay? And imagine you're looking at that movie that's running in the middle there, and you're trying to tell anything about exactly what the water molecule is doing, some specific spot in the protein. And, you know, when I looked at these kinds of movies, I couldn't tell anything. It just looked to me like a jumble moving around. And I've looked at these movies for years. <laughs> and, and in fact, I thought, well, maybe that's one of the reasons why no scientist has actually published a paper on how these hydrogen bonds rearrange on protein surfaces, because looking at computer screens didn't really help all that much. So then we had this idea to trigger a sound event each time a hydrogen bond forms. Um, so uh, there will be a brief sound event, and, and the uh, frequency of that sound event corresponds to the type of bond that's forming at that mm -hmm. time. So we can listen to this. Um, so what you may notice uh, is what we heard anyway was that there was like a soundscape. And mm -hmm. as we were traveling along this wiggly path there, um, you may hear the soundscape changing, almost like you're on a sound walk and entering different neighborhoods at different times. Right. And that's really the key. And now, of course, to interpret this by listening to it, you do need some training. You have to listen to these things for a while, just like a musician will, uh, you know, will have to do listening training, ear, tra ear training. But you will be able to hear, and the musicians certainly will have no trouble at all hearing that there's changes in the pattern of the sound as this trajectory moves along. That's telling you there's something changing in the way the protein and the water molecules interact through hydrogen bonds. And you wouldn't be able to see it in this movie. Yeah, so li listen, especially when there's a kink or a curve in, the, in that <clears throat> graph.
So we were pretty excited because we could mm -hmm. hear like it was changing over in these mm -hmm. different neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in patterns that were the same over and over again when you listen to different folding or unfolding events. In fact, Carla, you could pick out a single one if you want, if you have like a combination you like of okay, so uh, amino acids. This yeah. is glycine. Yeah, and but the, whichever, you know, if you want to turn on just one, the gluten. Okay. Glutamine 29 and run that, for example. I think it was pretty clear, even if you haven't listened to these a lot, that there was the incessant da 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 da, -da that started around you know, when, it, when it was moving over to that side and it didn't disappear until it was heading back again. That's a specific single hydrogen bond forming that's a sign that the protein is about to fold. And you know, I've listened to these movies now enough that I can, so this is like one you know, bar out of the score, or, or actually one line out of the score, I should say, and the, the, both the folded and unfolded bars playing. But I can listen to a whole bunch of these amino acids turn on at the same time and hear how they're correlated and what's going on just from, you know, sort of protein ear training, if you will call it that. <laughs> all right, Carla. So as Martin mentioned, we, all of us in the group, listen to a lot of these. Um, and we noticed that um, we, the way we were listening, or we learned to listen, was not so much to the individual events, but we were kind of listening for the density of these hydrogen bonds. Um, so this is another, this is an alternate mapping, sound mapping, um, and the picture has the residues on the y-axis. So these are like the positions where a bond could form. And then this is time on the, um, on the horizontal axis. The colors correspond between the left and the right picture, so yellow is where the transition takes place. Um, so I'll play it first. Um, listening with the original sonification. So you hear individual um, hydrogen bond events. So then we tried another experiment, a different kind of a mapping where we were treating um, the, uh, the Y dimension or the position, the residue was a frequency. And then the brightness or the density was the amplitude of that frequency. And that gave us a different way to listen to it where you're hearing more like a timbre that's changing over time, almost like a spectrum changing over time. Somehow at the start of that track, I always have to think of Mr. Scott beaming somebody up <laughs> in the Enterprise. But that, that gives away my age. But. All right, Carla. So this was a case of our ears telling our eyes where to look, which happens all the time Like if you're out walking in the woods mm -hmm. and you've heard a twig snap behind you. You're probably going to turn around and use your eyes to mm -hmm. see if there's something dangerous that caused that sound. Mm -hmm. um, so hearing the changes in the soundscape motivated us to go back to the original data and try to look for, uh, try to understand 
um, the source of those patterns that we could so clearly hear with our ears. Mm -hmm. So let's give you one last demo of this. Um, and uh, again, we are actually using this stuff both as a research tool. We're working on a paper that hopefully we'll submit to the National Academy of Sciences, you know, PNAS journal fairly soon, uh, but also educational. Uh, you know. So uh, what you see again here is the journey that we talked about before, where we have the unfolded chain on one side and the folded proteins over there on the left. And let me actually turn this around by uh, or uh, let me actually simplify this a little bit, uh, because in the models that we build for, as educational tools, uh, these kinds of computer simulations you need to do, that sort of calculations are, are really on the complicated side. And so what we did is we basically just rep represented the protein as a string of beads, and there's two kinds of amino acids, the white ones and the dark ones, and they interact with water molecules differently, which is what leads to the different kinds of motions. And the same kind of journey you just saw from a full computer calculation with all the atoms can actually take place in this simplified model. You have the extended protein on one side and then various disordered versions of the chain, and then eventually the chain forms this nice little hairpin, as we like to call it, uh, that is the folded state uh, of this. And let me actually take this picture and rotate it by 90 degrees. So the folded state here is at the bottom and the unfolded states are at the top. And that's actually what uh, an energy landscape, as we like to call it, of proteins looks like. So there's really only one folded state there, and there's a very large number of possible you know, configurations that corresponds to all the unfolded states of the protein. And all of these are higher in energy than the state that the protein uh, should fall into in order to be uh, folded. And, and Carla did a little bit of cleanup on this picture and organized the connections between the states to a little bit, bit more neatly using her Kima software that we were just listening to. So this is actually kind of the same picture again with the folded state at the bottom and then uh, the unfolded states at the top. And then the connect, connecting lines are the allowed transitions. So it turns out as a protein moves, it can't beam unlike Scotty. So you can't suddenly go from here to, to over there. You actually have to move through a series of steps right before you end up over there. And so that's why these purple lines don't connect all the possible states to all the other possible states. There's only certain connections that are allowed. And while the protein tries to fold, it basically follows those connections around this network. And there's maybe two states I want to point out in particular in the middle there, the one that is labeled RRLL and RSRR, and those are what we call traps. Uh, so, you know, proteins can be thwarted in their effort to actually get down to the uh, lowest energy state. And the reason is when you look at these traps, there are ways to escape out of them, but all of these ways lead upwards in energy. So if you fall into one of these traps, there's no way to just fall down. You've got to first go up in energy again, and then you can come down uh, to actually fold. And so uh, I think I can actually run this. Mm -hmm. Let me see if just I can... Just the down arrow sheet. Oh, just, okay. There. Together with the sonification. So the green shows the state that the protein is in, and it's basically moving between these different states as allowed by these purple pathways. And that got trapped, and it's kind of like... And it might manage to get out of there again. And it's in the other trap. And finally made it down to the folded state at the end. So again, it's a pretty contorted dynamics that actually takes place to take a protein from the folded state and all the kinds of things that we like to think of. There's traps, you know, bad states that are high in energy, you know, good states that are anthropomorphizing here, but all of this kind of stuff exists as roadblocks when a protein uh, is trying to fold. All right, so you want to, so as the last thing, Carla, you might as well explain what you're gonna show okay. next. So this is, uh, this is actually the same hairpin mm -hmm. protein, but this is, in this uh, visualization, the current state is the yellow square, and there's still purple lines showing where you could, what states you could visit next, which ones are allowed. Mm -hmm. so, so this gonna... yellow square is one of the traps that we just saw, and all the purple lines lead upwards in this case. So the only place you can go is up. And. Uh, and so Martin is going to try to help the protein get out of the trap by adding some heat to this, <laughs> adding temperature. Yeah, so this, you, you can just demonstrate. So this is just mm -hmm. what it's doing. I don't know if you can see mm -hmm. If you can see that red slider over there. So this corresponds to a high temperature. That means the water molecules around the protein are really bumping into it hard. That might actually knock it out of that trap. And if I go down here, I'm actually pretty close to absolute zero. Not quite, I think you said it at 0.01 Kelvin or something like that. So here the protein would be as frozen as we can get it. So I'll hold it down to be frozen and you can start the simulation. 
And you know, we're, we're frozen, so there's not really much it can do. But I'm going to raise the temperature now, uh, simply using the uh, you know, accelerometer in the phone to sense the motion of my hand. And you can see it's beginning to escape at this temperature here once in a while. I got it trapped again. Let's crank up the temperature some more. So now it's really beginning to hop all over the place, but it's getting bumped by those water molecules and it has a high amount of energy. And I got it down into the native state. I froze it back in right now, so it's stuck there. <laughs> now, th this is still a sonification because it's driven by a computer algorithm that determines what those paths are and the probabilities. But now we are actually getting to the verge of something having to do with music because there was at least a semi-performance involved. You know, though it's a pretty simple musical instrument. Ah, we're not at zero degrees, right? That's why once in a while it's still, you know, wants to jump. So, Carla? Oh, I think, um, so we did share the results <laughs> of this uh, 2D lattice model mm -hmm. in, um, in the Journal of Chemical Education in case, in case um, it's very realistic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just in case other instructors might be able to use these. We put it on YouTube as well. We have a YouTube channel called Protein Sonification, I think, mm -hmm. if you want to play more examples like that. Um, so let me kill that model. And so just to summarize, in digital audio, everything is data. Uh, basically, everything we do involves mapping streams of numbers to sound. Um, and we heard an example of listening to scientific data set as if it were a digital audio recording. Um, and several examples of using data to modify the parameters of a sound synthesis algorithm. Mm -hmm. Um, and this last example, we were actually generating the data from a model, in this case a 2D lattice model, um, and using the data to um, modify the parameters of a synthesis algorithm, mm -hmm. actually it was triggering percussion samples mm -hmm. associated with each state. Mm -hmm. And there was yet another stream of data which was coming from, that Martin was controlling, from a live stream of mm -hmm. accelerometer I data. I think of it as a one-dimensional theremin, <laughs> <laughs> since I only have that one axis I can move around. And, and so it was yet another stream of data, just another stream of numbers, in this case controlling the hyperparameters of a model. So that is a story about how one thing led to another in our collaboration, and we can hardly wait to find out what's going to happen next. Um, and now we turn things over to David to hear about his work using EEG data um, to create interactive musical experiences. OK. so. Um I have spent a, a lot of time over or quite a few years working with what, what I, for want of a better word, I call neuro music. Um, I've been involved in, in uh, the uh, experiencing uh, ways to analyze um, um, so what I call extended musical interface with the human nervous system. But it's uh, really uh, uh, about working primarily with uh, brain signals and uh, finding ways to correlate uh, what, we, what we can measure about them with various kinds of uh, states of, uh, of the person being measured, and also with musical production. And so I will be doing uh, a, a concert on Thursday in the Music Auditorium at 7.30, and one of the compositions being presented on that concert is, in fact, what I call a neuromusic piece or a brainwave music piece. And I'm going to try to give you a little bit of an inside story about how that works. So if you can come to the concert, you'll know a little bit more about it. And uh, just to show you uh, some examples of a couple of different ways of doing it. Uh, this picture, which is gone uh, <laughs> for some reason. There. <laughs> that picture, uh, I'm going to come back to later in the presentation, but it, it, it involves mapping resonant patterns uh, amongst uh, a group of people, uh, uh, four people in this case, whose brain signals are being monitored in what we call a hyper, hyper brain or a kind of hyper scanning of treating a group of brains as if they're one brain. Um, but for now, 
I want to uh, just show you a couple of, of examples. So the piece that will be played on Thursday is called Portable Gold and Philosopher's Stones, Deviant Resonances. There are three versions of this piece, the first of which was done in 1972. This version I put together in 2015. And oops, there we go again, no picture. Uh, there it goes, okay. Um, I have been um, uh, lately, and actually for a long time, working with uh, not just the idea of, of uh, translating information from one brain, but from more than one, because I'm very interested in the interaction of people, uh, two or more people uh, together in an environment and how they influence each other and what we can, what we can correlate. <clears throat> I'm very uh, working uh, now in a very, uh, uh, a very uh, early stage of uh, research in what I would call, what I call current complexity, where I, I am interested in measuring the complexity of a multimodal stimulus environment and correlating that with complexity measures that we can apply to the EEG. That's a complicated subject, but um, uh, in particular, I'm very interested in working with uh, people uh, interaction. Here we have two, two people in this piece, uh, the same piece that we'll be hearing on Thursday, uh, and me in the background. The person on the left is uh, uh, Tim Mullen, who's a, quite an important, uh, very significant neuroscientist, and the person on the right is a television newscaster. Anyway, so I work with them. Uh, this is a, uh, a picture of a control surface that um, I use to uh, to, uh, in this performance, the performance is actually like a trio. What happens is that there are two people who uh, begin to um, develop some control of what we call coherent waves, which are the smooth waves that we can record from the EEG that run anywhere from, from one to 40 hertz, but they, I concentrate in a region of about seven or eight to 13, 14, 15 hertz. And, uh, and uh, this is what I use to control the surface. And then I play with them after they get going for a while, so it becomes a trio. And so they're reacting to what I play and also reacting to what sound, the sound environment that is being generated by um, their own uh, brains in a kind of a neuro-cybernetic uh, feedback system. So they are learning to control uh, the sounds to a certain degree and then, um, and, and yet there are also things that there are the deviant resonances, I call, where, where it, it, one can't make an exact one-to-one, -one, and they might try to shift their attention to something, and they may or may not be successful at it, and then this, all sorts of new things happen in a, in, a, in, a, in a feedback environment. That's me playing with them again. Another image. This was a uh, setup at the... Uh, 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 Centre Pompidou in Metz in France, where this was presented several times. Here's the very first time this particular piece was tried uh, at a conference at Plymouth University in uh, 2015. You'll see just an example of two people who have had no experience uh, uh, doing this work um, and uh, me playing with them for a few seconds in the middle of, middle of this experience. Now, we don't have sound, apparently. Oh, wait a minute. No, I know, I know the problem, I think. Yeah, right. Where's my uh, sound? Uh, that should be the sound here. Why is it not showing? Oh, here we go. Yeah. Let me back it up. Hmm. Here we go. So um, the piece runs uh, in sort of three layers. First, there is a, a tracking of the coherent waves in a harmonic environment. Uh, it's not yet. Now we should hear sound. So 
And then we hear another layer that has to do with uh, looking for signals that, that are related to shifts of attention. And then there's a third layer that relates to uh, shifts of attention um, that are coincident, that, are, uh, that happen at the same time uh, amongst the two people. And then I'm playing with them, in this case on a keyboard, and uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the concert, I'll be using an electric violin. Now, um, before I go further, the, what I wanted to show you here is actually a, uh, something that requires me to hook up to um, the, the Wi-Fi in here. We've been having very, a lot of difficulty connecting the brain sensors, which look like this. There's a, there's a lot of uh, signal conditioning electronics in this very tiny little, uh, little uh, capsule. And there are electrodes inside these headbands uh, that are, are uh, uh, silver electrodes that are embedded in fabric. So you can put it on and uh, it will transmit via Bluetooth to a mobile device and then through uh, OSC signals that are commonly used in, uh, in music, but now in broader areas that go into the system. But I think we're going to actually try it with a guinea pig, and I think Martin would, wants to be the guinea pig. I so should, I should want to have 15 minutes of training. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll put this on, Martin, and then we'll just do a very I'll short, wipe just to get rid of the very, very, uh, uh, just a short demo of, of, of this, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about the way it's intended to work with in a more, somewhat more complex environment. I can see my students are getting worried. You want to use one of these? Yeah, I, I Oh, you already have it. Okay, great. Okay. So he, he has to sit uh, fairly still because these things, uh, they do try to reject muscle artifacts, but they're not always perfect in that sense. So. And we can at least check that the Wi-Fi is working that way. If we push against it or whatever, it should yeah, be. Yeah, 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 it, yeah, right. You can, you can catch something. So, so he has to have a, um, um, the, 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 the electrodes have to connect to the earlobes for reference and ground, and then about an inch above the eyebrows Maybe or so. Maybe want to double check that it's, the place my hair is not interfering. That looks pretty good, actually. All right. All right. Front should be okay. Front, that looks good. So now it sometimes takes a, a minute or two for the, for the signals to, con, uh, to condition themselves. Um, and I had some emergency help here trying to get a network connection that would get the signals into the system. So, so this is the what the uh, this is the control surface for the piece, and I will first of all um, see. We are not receiving, but let me see. You know, the thing has been sitting there for a while. Hang on a second. I think the auto turned off. Now let me just uh, make sure we're connected here. fairly low, but that's all right. I can boost it, I think. We need the signal to be coming in. something, but it's not. Hang on a second.
Well, it seems to have dropped its connection, its Wi-Fi connection or something. So hang on a second. Uh, wait a minute. You know, it's not. Uh, Check your uh, OSC settings and reactor. That's not what I mean. Just, just uh, hold still for a second. Oh, we tested this. You know, I guess I had about 15 minutes. The signal level is very low. Hmm? Yeah, let me go to reactor and see if we got. Uh, yeah. No, we got data coming in. Okay. All right, let me just see if I can scale it. Um, why it's not showing up here. No, no, no. Hang on. Uh, should be coming in here. Because I'm seeing it. This one, that's coming in. Okay. And um, but why is this frozen? This is not happening. We've got data coming in. Hmm. And should it be. On its connection is should be receiving here. Send one that should be okay. That should be okay. That should be okay. That should be okay. But yet it's frozen. Um, let me do, I'm going to try, I'm going to try to restart this, this program. Um, we had all this working perfectly this morning and then, and then and we got in this room and we had network interactions that, and if, if we can't get it, I can, I can still show a demo, but um, uh, let me try this. Try this again. There we go. Now we're getting something. All right. Now it's working. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, all right. So Martin will just sit still. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do three things. Or, well, I'm going to do two of the three, three things. One, you'll hear a, a, a harmonic environment that will come in that will be that will be uh, created by a series of uh, four-note uh, pulse wave chords, which are being scanned by resonant filters according to the envelope of his coherent waves. And uh, as he gets better and better at it, 
it opens up to give him more control. So you will see, you will hear it more drone-like at the beginning, and then you'll start to hear more detail as he gets, as the bursts, uh, coherent bursts get longer, it opens up to give him more, uh, the, en the envelope or the, or the fluctuations in the amplitude uh, are allowed to happen at a faster rate. So it starts to trill and things like that. Let's hope, let's see what happens here. All right. this. So first of all, imagine you didn't hear that because that would have been the setting for a second person. And turn that off. Now here's the here's here's Martin.
time I avoided opening up my eyes yeah. so that uh, all hell doesn't break loose in the yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Martin. So that would be, um, um, that's just a little hint of the, of the piece that you would hear. Um, when there are two people, uh, the coincident uh, um, uh, uh, shifts that uh, are um, uh, detected as kind of interruptions of the, uh, of the, of the smooth waves at a particular minimum uh, rate of change, uh, which is a threshold that uh, that uh, can be set and that can be moved. It can be moved up and down so that you want, if you want more activity, you can lower the threshold and then it'll it'll uh, create uh, more of these. Uh, uh, it'll react more to shifts. Uh, and if you up uh, you turn up the threshold, then of course it takes a much bigger shift in order to to cause these extra sounds to come in. But so that's just a little a little hint and and. Thank you. So, yeah. <laughs> so um, all right. So that's that's that part. Now let me go to uh, back to my my uh, slides here. And if I can do this, I want to switch back to the this Wi-Fi, and I'll show you. A couple other things. So, um, so here's a here's a um, here's a diagram of the signal flow. So, uh, so you can see we have these EEG receivers. Uh, they are um, uh, the, the, they're going through uh, various filters and scaling and, and so on, tracking pitch, and also tracks pitch, and which uh, maps the pitch is mapped onto a a modal uh, scale space that I, I can uh, control. Um, the, the holophone is the, uh, the ringing sounds that you heard uh, that um, uh, are the more drone-like continuous sounds, uh, banks of filters. And then we have threshold detection, and we look for concurrent changes in the signals. They're mapped into a certain pitch space and then out to the synthesis, uh, synthesis uh, circuits. Um, here's another picture of another performance of that. You'll see something like that on Thursday. Um, this is actually a painting I made years and years and years ago uh, based on uh, the idea of uh, visual phosphenes, which are the colored patterns you can see when your eyes are closed and they're being stimulated by something or you press on your eyeballs or you have, it can done, be done with electrical stimulation or chemical stimulation. Uh, and you'll see a big circle that rotates over the course of 27 minutes. It makes one 360-degree rotation. And then there's some musical notation that comes into, into it. So it'll be a multimedia show. Um, that's what we just did. Uh, there is a studio-controlled recording of, a, of, a, uh, a, um, of actually four people doing this. Uh, that is available on a CD, which sounds a little bit like this. Now that's done under highly controlled environment and environments in a studio where you're not you're not uh, dealing with the. Uh, pressure of performance with high-tech sensitive stuff, <laughs> but and then uh, edited in, on a CD. Then I want to show you one other example. Uh, this is a piece done uh, 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 in 2014, 2015. This is a picture of it uh, as it was presented in a retrospective of my work at the Whitney, the new Whitney Museum in New York. Um, called Ringing Minds, and this is a different idea. This, this works with a concept uh, I mentioned called hyperscanning, where we have four uh, brainwave participants, uh, and we are also measuring um, uh, what are called event-related potentials, which are transient waveforms that take some significant uh, signal processing in order to extract, because they're very small, but they're, they are averaged across the four Brain, so it's a it's a collective response, and uh, this is was its first uh, 
presentation in San Diego. The, my collaborators, Tim Mullen and Alex Khalil, are from the uh, uh, Schwartz Center for Computational Neuroscience at UCSD in California. And so we had, this was an outdoor performance. We had four people uh, with this uh, uh, treated as a hyper, a hyper brain. Uh, Tim is running software on his computer that is calculating uh, these uh, and making inferences about the hyper brain state. And then that is, information is coming to my system and then we also play with them. Um, it works with something called uh, principal oscillation patterns uh, that, with a method that actually comes from uh, research in uh, epilepsy, uh, where the intent is to try to discover the, the, the uh, emergence of uh, resonant patterns in neural networks that are just beginning to emerge, with the idea of being able to detect the, uh, uh, something that might grow and overtake the brain and cause a seizure. seizure. Uh, so, this, the techniques that came from that, um, ha, have, uh, we, we drew from those techniques in order to make this piece. Uh, and this is the, the event-related uh, potential detection going to a, uh, a bank of what I call complex resonators. They're, they're digital circuits that are, think of them as like electronic bells, but they're more than just bells. They can have a stability value that causes the pitch to move. They can have injections of noise, depending on the nature of the signal, uh, and they can ring for longer or shorter periods of time, all controlled by these principal oscillation components. Um, this is just a, a display of uh, the, uh, the, the research that this draws on, uh, trying to find these principal oscillation components in the EEG uh, with respect to, uh, uh, in this case, intended uh, to, to uh, provide in more information about, about um, the, these, these resonant patterns that can grow out of control in a brain. And this back to that display that was at the beginning, this is actually showing each column is a set, is a set of samples uh, from uh, a, a frequency range on this axis of 0 to 40 hertz. Uh, so uh, there's a, uh, there, there is a, a 40 channel essentially measurement. These are coming from actually subdural electrodes that are not on the, on the skin, but they're actually um, uh, under the skin. Uh, and uh, in uh, uh, patients who were, who were being evaluated for surgery, epilepsy, uh, epilepsy uh, mitigation. Uh, this is the uh, control surface. Each of these uh, little boxes is one of these, like, these uh, resonators. There are 40 of them, and they're mapped across that frequency space. So, so um, each time there is a sample calculated from the hyperbrains, uh, we get 40 values. And the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the values, this is the, what the inside of this reactor program looks like, uh, the values are mapped in this way. So we have we have um, 40 numbers, index number for the principal oscillation component. We have its frequency. We have the da its damping time. How long, how long is it ringing before it damps away? Um, the, its excitation level, uh, a value that indicates whether it's a, a, what we call an oscillator or a relaxator. Um, its pitch stability, how, how stable it is and it's, div it's spatial div uh, dispersion across the four brains. So if you imagine four, you can, uh, you can well, here's a resonant pattern um, that's being detected, and the people over here are contributing more to it than the ones over here. Uh, and that's, that's uh, a, 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 an indication of something about the, the group activity. And that's being mapped on synthesis parameters uh, here, uh, an index for the resonator, um, the, uh, the a scale of gamuts that are, that are used to create its pitch, its decay time, its amplitude. Ha, um, for an exciter circuit, it, uh, it rings, and for a um, uh, relaxator value, it injects stochastic values into the ringing, so it, it injects a kind of noise component. Uh, the stability of the, of the ringing uh, is mapped onto the variance of random modulation of the pitch. 
uh, and its dispersion has to do with its position in space uh, across the uh, multi-channel audio, audio, audio space. Uh, it's described in this book. There have been several publications recently that are really, really, um, uh, really surveying this field of what we call brain art. Here's another one. Uh, there's lots of people working in this field now. When I first started in 69, 70, there were just a very few. Now it's a big field, and there are international gatherings and so on. Um, so here's the picture of the, of the four um, wearing multi-channel electrodes. In this case, they're, they're not just single channels, but they're, they're um, uh, multi-channel. They, they use dry electrodes that uh, they're actually, they can get kind of uncomfortable because they have these, these uh, dry electrodes that have the little, they look like a little spider legs that go against the skin. Um, so you can wear them for about 20 minutes and then it gets, starts to not feel very good. But they're very, uh, very high quality. So then we also make a display um, which maps the, these, re these resonant patterns. Um, and, and these are sort of splashes of light that fall onto the skin, I mean skin, on the wall. Um, and um, they are, we, we thought of the metaphor of you know, dropping a stone in a pond and, and it's, it, its influence spreads out in a wave pattern. So the, uh, the uh, uh, dispersion across the four participants is uh, mapped uh, uh, on this axis, its frequency on this axis, and then the color and the intensity and, and these, how these splashes work um, uh, uh, is driven by the other, some of the other factors that are in that data mapping. Uh, their amplitude, its, uh, its uh, stability, and so on, those things. So uh, there's another picture of it. Here's uh, a little bit of sound. So you hear these, these are the, this, this bank of resonators that are being hit by what's dis discovered across the 40 hertz range. There are 40 of them, one for each position. And here is a little bit of video so you can see the, uh, the, how the, how the um, light splashes are mapped. If it will come up. Yes, so it's going to Vimeo. So Alex is playing a, uh, a stone what he calls a litho harp. It's a stone uh, xylophone. The piano is playing the evoked responses, the shapes of the evoked responses. It's a Yamaha disc here. Seemed like a good place to stop, so, <laughs> so that, was the, that was the ending of that. Um, let's see. Where are we time-wise? We have a little more time? Okay. So one last example of uh, a, a mapping of this stuff in a, in a way that uh, tries to deal with uh, human affect, but in a theatrical situation. Um, in, also in 2015, 
uh, colleagues and I produced an opera in uh, Los Angeles called Hopscotch. Uh, it was quite an affair. Uh, it was an opera for 24 cars, limousines, uh, and the audience was driven around in the cars. And if you bought a ticket for it, you'd be told to show up at a certain street corner and uh, there'd be a stage manager there and pretty soon uh, a limousine would drive up and some people would get out and you'd be asked to get in. You'd get in, the driver would take off and there would be a performance happening right in front of you in the car. So, the, so you're here in a seat, the performer's like this far away from you. Of course, we couldn't, get, couldn't have done that during the pandemic, but, but this was before that. So they were there and you would, you, would, you would experience a scene of the opera of which there were there were, um, I think there were 24 live ones and, and another eight or so that were, were animated. Um, and something like that. And then you would be driven, while that scene takes place to a, to a location in Los Angeles, you'd be asked to get out and there would be a site-specific performance there. And a different group of people would get in the car and then they would take off. And then after you have experienced the site-specific scene, another car would drive up and you'd, people would get out, you'd get in, and you'd see another scene. And it would go around and you, you, you're, uh, you would uh, drive around LA. It was enormously successful. It would, ran for weeks and weeks, um, running on, primarily on weekends, but all day long. So the poor performers of each scene, I think, ended up doing this piece about 400 times or something like that. It was, it was quite, a, quite something. Um, so, all right, it's, uh, so there's a, it's a narrative that um, has, uh, it's sort of like a modern uh, Orfeo story, uh, but it, uh, uh, with, a, with a, uh, an overlay of uh, some, some things about immigration and, and uh, m migration in the United States. And so one of the main characters is a, is a, a young 15-year-old woman who's, uh, who's, it starts out with her quinceanera, which actually takes place in the car. I wrote the music for that. And then we follow her till she's about 60 years old and through her relationships. And one of them is a character called Jameson who is searching, searching, searching for answers in the world and uh, ends up becoming a kind of a mad scientist who, um, is trying to find out whether heaven and hell live only in the mind. And so uh, one of the scenes has the audience get into the car and Jameson gets into the car and he tells them that he's going to sing to them a series of questions that they are not to answer. They are only to think their answers. And they're wearing, all wearing headbands at present. And the, the um, there are, there is a variety, or there are sets of possible answers, kinds of answers to the questions that have been pre-recorded uh, by a soprano. And the, the mix of the um, coherent waves of the, of the uh, people in the car actually mix those answers. So if they're in a kind of agitated state, you're gonna get one kind of singing if they're very relaxed and mellow, you'll get something else. If they're not paying attention, you'll get, get something else. So that's the idea. So, so, so here is the scene. This is the control surface, which would, we were able to install this successfully inside a, a car. And well, that's actually, you can see the, the uh, here we have, the, these are the uh, four channels of raw EEGs from uh, each of the four participants. Uh, filtered into different bands, and then they're being tracked. These are some of the, the, uh, the preset, um, I mean, the pre recorded samples for the questions, and then uh, some other things that go along with it. So it's about, uh, it's about sort of in, uh, an interactive engagement of sort of affective reactions to the way these questions go in the narrative of the, of the scene. And the questions get more and more aggressive. As, you, as they go through the, through the narrative. But so an example might be, here's just, just some photographs, these were staged, of what it was like inside the car. And this is Jameson, the, the sort of mad scientist. And so here's- Have you ever watched the gray ocean on a placid morning? 
Did you ask it something? Did it answer? So that goes on. But then here's a, this is a staged version rather than inside a car. And here are some, uh, uh, here's what the answers would sound like. So that's a different kind of day of mapping. <laughs> and uh, the, those chords were, each time there was one of those chords, it would be because all four of the participants were uh, producing a significant shift at the same time, exactly the same time of the, of the amplitude of their coherent waves. And this, I just threw this up. Um, this, is, this was published originally in, in around 1990. And then there's a revised version in 19, uh, sort of 97. It's one of the more technical of my monographs about how I work with uh, musical structures and, and these things. Um, this was published by Leonardo. Um, I, the revised version is on my website. It can be downloaded for free if anyone is interested. And then just a nod to where I kind of started back in the mid 70s with a book called Biofeedback in the Arts that is now a rare book, but it seems to be coming back and it's kind of demand. So uh, people seem to be interested in it. And that's where I'll stop. I suppose we might have an opportunity. Yeah, I think we have some time for questions. So if there's any For any of us, yeah. Audience questions or whatever. No. Yes. I'm just curious to like uh, when you do the car survey, you take signal from people's brains, and then how do you translate them into those music? Well, it, there are an infinite variety of ways of doing it, but uh, what you what you heard today is just a, a, a little hint of of the sonic environment that I've essentially composed. Although you know, I would say. It's, a, it's an interactive piece. It's not a composition in the traditional sense of uh, having a fixed form, because it's a, it completely emergent, right? It'll be, be different every time. And so it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a self-organizing kind of process. Uh, but I make choices about what kind of sound to, uh, to use to reflect different changes of state in the brain signal. Um, and you know the brain signal is a waveform, and so it, we can do whatever we want with these waveforms. You know, we can track their frequencies, their amplitudes, and attach those to different quality, different kinds of sounds. So, yeah, yeah. It's still data, just like both. <laughs> can I ask a question of both of you? Sure. Can you talk about the subject of experience? Uh, and also, I'm curious how much you were controlling from, from the interface and how much was coming from the Right. What I was doing was um, I was opening up. There were four, um, four of those uh, scannings of the, of the, there was a pulse wave cord, right? And uh, there were four um, filter processes that uh, scanned them to make that the drone, the more like the droning sound. And I selectively brought them in one at a time, and the amplitudes would move the filters up and down the spectrum. So that was him. Uh, but I brought them in one at a time slowly and sort of set them at a center point, and then the amplitudes of his, um, uh, uh, the, the envelope of uh, his, uh, the waveforms were moving them up and down. And then uh, when you heard those sort of blips and bleeps, 
that was I was just bringing in um, the uh, some of the sounds that result from detecting a significant uh, shift in the envelope that moves at a sort of fast enough rate that it triggers a blip. So I brought that in. Uh, so um, and then I. I changed the sound of it a couple of times, just what the sound was that was being triggered, those blip sounds. Did you feel like you were interacting with each other? Did it feel? Oh, I mean, I don't know. Well, I was sitting there with my eyes closed. I had my brain sort of goes through simulated states of terror or relaxation or various things. And, I mean, it didn't have an effect on, on what it sounded like. The overall ramping up and down of the signal and the increase in complexity, I think that came from your. Yeah, yeah, that was me opening it up and then closing and like, it up. Yeah, and it was I, I was watching to see how the, there were there was there were longer bursts of of the more coherent waves, and so uh, when I would see that I would kind of open up the 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 the, the, the range a, a little bit. That I did, but I was doing it by watching what was coming uh, uh, from Martin, and then uh, and then I slowly brought everything down to the end. Now, normally, it, it's difficult to really get into it deeply in a short demo, but uh, you know, it, it, it's best if you have quite you know an extended time to to really get into it. Um, uh, so um, it's just a hint of what it, what it can be like. I do detect the frequency. Okay, so yeah. Can you kind of tell people to try to get into that relaxed the, what I, the instructions I give, and, and again, there are, there, are, there are really two ways to do this, and they're both different but both interesting. One is uh, with people who have um, no experience with it at all, right? And the other was, is with people who uh, re repeatedly practice it. We're, and by practicing, just like practicing a musical instrument, you, de you can develop more nuanced control. Uh, and when, that, when you do that, then, then I'm interested in how people can feel like they're following, you know, I, I, I say, you can allow your attention to move to whatever it is that you are, what, that attracts your attention, or you can decide to try to direct your attention to something. And that's very, uh, that's a very uh, sort of interesting place to be uh, where you're sort of both playing the role of trying to initiate something and also just being part of a circuit, you know, being part of a larger something, uh, feedback loop that you're, you're an element of. Yeah, you can mess it up by with your muscle fingers. Right, right. Right. Yeah. So two things about this. Um, what kind of differences do you see between the Muse S here with the more limited EEG sensor array uh, versus the integrations you were using in the hyperbrain piece, with, which seem to have more electrodes on them, right? Uh, so do you see a big difference in the type of data you get out of that, and how does it affect um, the ability to, to maybe drive change through mental processes? And then uh, with you as a co-performer, do you notice that if you shift things in the sound, uh, you can kind of set off a reaction in the person? Can you, can you engender some kind of change by making the sound really aggressive or say changing you know, the temporal characteristics of the sound? Then does that affect the mental state of the performers and you get this feedback loop between right. them hearing and the neural activity? Right, there's a lot in that. So. Um, in the, um, let's say in the two-person version, which is like the, you know, we're gonna do, you, you can, sometimes there'll be a change in the sound and you're not, maybe you're not quite sure where it came from, but then you both react to it. And then that causes something. That, you know, that'll, that'll, uh, that'll cause an interruption in the coherent wave and then, and then it'll be, there'll be a simultaneous shift. Uh, that's interesting to try to 
kind of uh, try to sort of recognize as you're doing it. Uh, it again, it, it's 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 not easy to do that right off the bat. It takes some it takes some practice, uh, and also there is a and and in the hyperbrain situation, it's a little bit different because there you re, there the analysis is really as if it's one brain. So 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 f the 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 what. I've never been one of those four people, but what, what I hear from them talking and just subjectively reporting what it was like is that they, they sort of feel like they're part of something bigger than them. It's not easy to, to, then, to create or to feel a one-to-one -one cause and effect uh, in terms of what's going on, uh, but it, because you're you know, it's a complex environment, but also uh, you, it, it's for people. So that sometimes it feels like to them that there's a sort of a mass movement towards something, a group movement towards something. Um, and other times it, it feels like they're more separate. Um, there, is, uh, there is a difference in, um, in general not, uh, it's very hard to make very specific determinations for individuals, but it tends to be the case that people who are used to experiencing some form of regular practice of something, right, um, it could be music, obviously yoga or meditation or some uh, thing like that, or it could be other things that involve really sustained attention uh, that you practice regularly, may, the people, like that tend to find their way into it faster, right? Uh, so that's a, that's a sort of general observation. Um, I, in these, these uh, preliminary studies in that, uh, that track uh, complexity, what I call concurrent complexity, um, when people are listening to a sonic stimulus and you're measuring the complexity of that and you're measuring the complexity of the brain signal, not getting into what is complexity. Let's leave that alone for a minute. But um, that they track in parallel, but it's more, um, the more musical experience they have, the more the tracking is, is, uh, is uh, apparent and it's, it's more consistent. So what does that say? It says that maybe they're uh, people with more musical experience are more used to listening to and parsing out a more complex sound environment, right? Uh, and so, so we see differences like that. I have something I can throw at it. I mean, one thing we noticed um, is because Martin also studied music in addition to being uh, in addition to science, uh, that he was able to hear patterns very quickly. So there is a certain training, and I think it's reasonable to expect that we should be, we should listen and do, you know, like all skills that you're training. Uh, it's very reasonable to expect some period of training, sort of attentive listening, because it seems like everything in our, everything around us seems to be trying to make us not listen, right? Because there's there's sound everywhere. A lot of it's noise. You're wearing earbuds all the time, and um, so people are kind of got used to 
letting the sound be going into the background. And this mm -hmm. requires a very different kind of listening of, of what you call listener's performance, what we call active listening. But it's like you're really listening with the expectation that there is something to hear, that there's something. Right, there. right, right. Yeah. I call that active imaginative listening. Uh, but it's, uh, and I, 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 that's part of the instruction to the performers too that I give them is that, that you know, you're an active imaginative listener. You want to listen deeply, uh, but also imaginatively, right? So, and so, and we're dealing with a very interesting, interesting world here where, where you know, you know, science and art convergence kind of thing, in that. Um, the, the the sonification of data can have multiple purposes. You know, one purpose is to try to understand what's going on in a phenomenon, and then other purposes uh, lean a little more towards art making, right? So, but the the way that they blend across is very interesting to work with. Uh, additionally, you know, the the integrated powers of our senses here are really f incredible, really phenomenal. Here's a, here's couple of examples. Um, I remember the old days of programming computers. You mentioned a PDP-8. I use a PDP-8 <laughs> and, and a PDP-10 and a 12. <laughs> but, but we watched, and I had an inner data uh, computer. Anyway, in those days, the panels of the computers had lights that blinked on and off according to the contents of the registers. So you'd see, you know, if it was a 16-bit register, you'd see 16 lights just going like this as the data went in and out of those registers. And I remember experiences both visually and sonically by just listening really crudely, you know, to the contents of a register. When trying to debug a complicated program, you're trying to figure out what's going on, what's going on, and you can look at it or you can listen to it. And all of a sudden, you hear a pattern. You say, oh, there's a loop. <laughs> right? <laughs> they recently found out that Alan Turing did that. Oh, uh, yeah? Really? That yeah. Was, so you, you know, oh, there, there's a loop. It's stuck. You know, and then, you, and then maybe you can sort of detect it. You can use your detective skills to get down to find where the problem is. So that's one example. Um, uh, on the music side, there's a wonderful uh, composition by Richard Teitelbaum, composer, who unfortunately passed away recently, um, called Tai Chi Alpha Tala. So this was one when we were both at York University in Toronto and, and experimenting. Both of us were experimenting in this world. And um, he, ha um, he had a, a collaborator named Barbara Mayfield, who was uh, very much a Tai Chi person. And she was wearing uh, EEG monitoring devices with, that, were, uh, that transmitted data over FM. And we would capture the data over FM as she would do her, and she'd do this in a performance, like in a live performance. And um, I, I, uh, ma I, I used that data to uh, drive a synthesizer. In this case, it was an ARP 2500. Anybody remembers that one? Uh, creating, just following the rhythmic patterns of it, basically. And our, our uh, uh, fourth collaborator was the brilliant uh, South Indian Murdungam player, South Indian drummer named Trichy Shankaran, world-class master. He played with that stuff, and what he was doing was listening to the rhythms created from the brain signals and finding patterns in them and elaborating those patterns. So he was like a correlation computer, <laughs> you know, by himself making these patterns. It was phenomenal how, how that happened. One last comment when you were talking about people um, having different uh, experiences with what you call chaotic uh, stuff. Reminds me of uh, some studies done a long time ago by um, a psychologist named Paul Witz, who was at that time at NYU. And he was uh, exploring the way in which uh, people responded to stimuli over various parametric ranges. Let's just say pitches. 
and they were, they were, you play people a bunch of pitches and you want them to rate them. So like an affective state, scale according to their pleasantness or yeah, whether they're positive or negative reaction. And what you almost always get is an inverted U curve where it starts out neutral uh, at the low end and then it goes up in the, in the positive affective rating uh, when you get sort of in the mid-range and then it starts to go down as it gets higher and higher until it gets so high it starts to go below the zero and it gets, uh, actually becomes negative. Sort of an inverted U curve. Uh, there was a, um, sometimes known as a Wundt curve. Um, and after a late 19th century researcher. Um, so he did that with many, many different, you know, loudness, uh, pitch, whatever, timbre, brightness, different kinds of parameters, and always get some sort of curve like that. Interesting, the pitch one, I think, was sort of right, in, sort of in the center of the sort of female speaking voice. Maybe uh, we like the sound of our mother's voice or something. But anyway, um, he also then tried it with sequences uh, of, uh, in this case, just sequences of pitches that were, um, uh, that had different degrees of variance. Another way of similar to chaos or predictability. So uh, he found the same thing, you know, too little, you know, a little variance was sort of neutral and then a certain, a certain degree of variance was the most positive and then it get too much variance and it starts to get negative. But when selecting subjects for musical experience, the curve starts to get wider. So the, the positive affect gets wider and wider until, um, I don't think he published this final stuff, but there were some super musicians who were brought in and basically it just flattened out. In other words, they like everything because they can, they can use their active imaginative listening to derive something out of almost anything, right? So there you have. Yeah. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. Okay. All right.